I'm Brad Beebe with Amazon. I run Amazon Neptune, which is Amazon Web Services, or AWS's fully managed graph database service. Like apparently a lot of folks in this room, I've been involved in the technology space for a long time. I uh, have really enjoyed the last day and a half, and I've learned a lot. You know, over the years, I've been to a lot of conferences in this technology space, and people talk about what could be done, what you might be able to do, what is the possibility if you start thinking about ontologies and using semantic technologies. But, you know, I think one of my takeaways was just really hearing so many stories from Goldman's, from Capital One, from Airbnb, from Uber, from others about how not just they're thinking about using these technologies, but they are using knowledge graphs. And they are using knowledge graphs and they're getting results and they're affecting their business positively and they're doing things that they couldn't do before. So I think it's really exciting you know, to see that and see this sort of space emerge in that way. Amazon is famously customer obsessed. We have a process that we call working backwards, which is how we build and it affects almost everything that we do. And what working backwards means in essence is that we listen to our customers. We ask them what they want. We try and understand what they're really trying to do. And that's how we go about launching new products, launching new features, and really understanding how and why we, we build what we build. So when we launched Amazon Neptune almost a year ago, so in the, the end of May 2018, Neptune itself was the result of the, one of these working backwards processes. So we listened to customers, we heard what kinds of graph use cases they had. And based on that, you know, we launched the service. And since the service has been launched, of course, customers have surprised us. Um, they've done things that we expected, they've done some things that we haven't expected. But we've had a lot of opportunity to see how different customers in different spaces use graphs, in general use knowledge graphs specifically. And so what I wanted to talk about today was just to share some of those lessons that we have about that. Now, sort of anecdotally, some of you may know that uh, before I joined AWS, I uh, was with BlazeGraph, the sort of open source RDF graph database. And you know, when I was at BlazeGraph, I was really trying to get customers who may have been using our open source package in some way to buy support or you know, fund a particular feature or you know, in some ways make this more of a commercial arrangement. And so I talked to lots of different interested BlazeGraph users. When I joined AWS, the sort of level of customer trust and customer access is such that working at AWS, I've met five to 10 times more BlazeGraph users and BlazeGraph customers than I ever did when we were running the company and trying to sort of talk to people in that way. So I think it, you know, it, it sort of reinforces to, to a point both the customer access and also Dean's point that you know, there's a lot more of this technology around that people are using and they're using effectively, uh, but they, you know, to date they really haven't, haven't yet talked about it. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So there's three things that I wanna cover today and there are also, conveniently, three things that I'd like you to take away, if you take away nothing else. Number one, graphs are awesome, and customers are using them to do really amazing things. Number two, Neptune is a fully managed graph database service. This means that you can spend less time managing your graph database, and more time doing the really hard things about building knowledge graphs trying to understand and extract the meaning from the source systems. Customers are really excited about Graph, but they need help to get started. They want to do Graph. They want to build knowledge graphs. In some cases, they know how to do it. In other cases, they need guidance. They need tools. They need help. They need this, these kinds of conferences and understanding to sort of understand what are the best practices? How can we be successful? Any questions? <laughs> All right. So as I mentioned, when we launched Neptune, you know, 
we knew that graph was important to customers or we wouldn't have launched the service. But you know, I think since we've launched it, what we've seen is that in many cases, the use cases and things that people are doing with Graph and Neptune are not what we would call lift and shift type workloads. It's not taking something that they have an existing application and converting it to use a graph database or converting it to use a fully managed uh, solution. It's really more about customers looking at parts of their organization that aren't connected but maybe should be or could be and create more value and using these kinds of tools to build and store and process relationships and using them to build new business value, build new applications and build new things. And I think for me, that's really the most exciting part about sort of being in the space. So why are they able to do that? Well, it's really about the graph model, right? It's that in a graph space, relationships are first class citizens. They're first order entities in the model. So I can talk about them directly. I can ask questions of them directly. I can traverse them directly. I don't need to hide them you know, inside of another data modeling technique. And so, you know, often we talk about this in terms of, of examples that many customers can understand. And so if you think about a social network and you think about the connections in there, if you have 10 people in their connections, that's interesting. But if you have 10,000 or 10 million or 10 billion, now you have a really rich connected data structure that can answer many different questions. And the same is really true in the knowledge graph space. Graphs, of course, are very cross-cutting across domains. They show up almost everywhere. We see knowledge graphs, and we've seen a lot more knowledge graph use cases emerging. Uh, sometimes they, they come in the form of customer 360, and we've seen a lot of that today. Sometimes they, they come in the form of trying, just trying to improve information retrieval, uh, things like Alexa, things like Amazon shopping that we've seen. So knowledge graph use cases are a big part of what we see from Amazon Neptune. So just to give you sort of our general example, I think for the folks that are familiar with the W3C, you know, we'll start off with kind of the, the primer on knowledge graphs. So we have the Louvre, a very famous museum, the Mona Lisa, a very famous piece of art. But if we want to add some information, maybe we have some social network pieces, we can see some shared interest, and we add that, and we start to augment and build our knowledge graph. Now we have a little bit more. We also have some travel data. We have some travel history. Where did th these people travel? Uh, where are things located? And when we're able to combine these different data sets, we have reference information, social network information, travel history. Now we've built a structure where we can start to answer a lot more interesting and complex questions. So we can say things like, who painted the Mona Lisa? Or what museum should Alice visit while in Paris? Or what other artists have paintings in the Louvre? So one of our public reference customers is Thomson Reuters. Uh, we heard from uh, Refinitiv uh, yesterday. This use case is a Thomson Reuters tax use case. And it's pretty interesting because often when people think about graph applications or think about knowledge graphs, they don't really think about tax. But I've seen many, many different uh, tax applications in various different reg tech. And so in this case, what they're doing is that they built a graph model of global tax policies by geographic region. And then they also have built a graph model of their customers' corporate and legal entities. And they've launched a new service that effectively allows their customers to both understand the tax obligations that they have based on this model of, of policies and their particular operating structures. And then as a second order effect, it helps them to then optimize their tax posture. And so we see lots of these kinds of use cases where people are using knowledge graphs to encode some kind of policy, to encode something that they want to affect, and it allows them to either improve their ability to do it or reduce their cost of doing it. In this case, it enabled Thomson Reuters to launch a new service. So overall, so lots of different customers on Neptune. Uh, Siemens has launched a service called MindSphere, which is powered by Neptune. It uses, we heard yesterday about digital twins. It uses a graph model to track the different schematics of buildings at various different levels, all the way down to where sensors and furniture is, is located within a building. So they can provide a service to their customer to understand where is that sensor? What's that 
piece of information that's next to it. When we launched the service, we had a public reference uh, from Alexa. Uh, and Alexa has, has, is on record as saying that Amazon Neptune is part of the technology suite that they use to build their knowledge graph. And it was interesting because we had been in preview almost uh, six months prior. And at that time, all Alexa was willing to acknowledge was the fact that they use Neptune at all. So uh, even Alexa is coming, coming on board from the knowledge graph side. So to get to the second aspect about a fully managed graph database service. So when you want to build a knowledge graph, you need to store it somewhere. And so the question is, what are your options to store that graph? And so we asked ourselves and said, well, can I store a graph using a relational database? And the answer that we found was that, yes, absolutely you can. But the challenges are that the way that you express traversals over that in a relational database are through complex SQL joins. These are difficult to write. They often encode knowledge in them that's Un unintentional, and they're slow to execute because relational databases aren't optimized for the same access patterns that you, de that you need to process in a graph. But potentially even more significant is because of these performance considerations, often what we found was that when customers tried to process graphs with relational or key value or document store type technologies, they ended up having to change their data model to ask the questions that they wanted over the graph. And that means that every time you want to add a new relationship or you potentially want to add a new query, you have to make a data model change. Well, the core agility from graphs comes from being able to make new relationships quickly across things that you didn't expect to connect or weren't designed to be connected. And so when you choose these other sort of technologies, you lose that agility. And so from our perspective, Graph databases give you an option to be much faster in terms of deploying your graphs and getting them into production. Now, as we talked about a little bit, there's really two major graph models. There's something called property graphs, there's labeled property graphs. Property graphs consist of nodes and edges. The, they can both have properties. The leading open source framework for property graphs is something called Apache Tinkerpop. It has an imperative traversal language called Gremlin that allows you to write traversals over property graphs. There's also some vendor-specific implementations of property graph query languages, uh, Cypher, property graph query language, there's a few others. Uh, OpenCypher is an open source released version of the Cypher language. Property graph in general has relatively few standards, if any, around it, although that's something that's you know, rapidly changing with some of the property graph schema working group and things that are going on overall. On the other side, there's the resource description framework, or RDF, and the semantic web stack around it. Of course, RDF was originally designed to describe resources on the web, so it has inherently very strong concepts about identities. It uses IRIs, or internationalized resource identifiers, to give that, that strong sense of identity. And it has a declarative graph query language over RDF, which is called Sparkle. So customers often ask us, which one should I use for which application? And the, yeah, right. And so it, it's been a challenging question to, to answer. I think that you know, the way that, that I've come to answer it recently is that you know, property graphs really appeal to developers. People who are building applications really tend to gravitate towards property graphs. And people who are thinking about data models, they're thinking about information, they're thinking about, about the meaning, the business rules, your information architects, they appeal and, and are drawn naturally towards RDF. But you know what we increasingly see is that customers build knowledge graphs in both models. And customers would like to be able to take the strengths of both models to use in their graph applications and their knowledge graphs. They want to take the power that comes from RDF and the associated standards for exchanging data, for doing data canonicalization and data normalization. And then they want to give 
a property graph view of that to their customers so that their business developers can build applications over it and use it in the way that, that, that is very familiar to them. So I think from our perspective, we see that there's good use cases for both, and we see increasingly that there's use cases for interoperability between them. So Neptune itself is a fully managed graph database service. So fully managed in this case means that we operate the service for you. You choose the instances to use, and you choose the size of the instances, and then all of the patching, the management, are all things that we provide for you. Neptune itself supports both of the property graph and the RDF stack, and we have optimized query execution for both. So if you ask us to evaluate a gremlin traversal, we'll optimize its execution, and we'll execute it within our storage layer, and we do the same thing for RDF and Sparkle. The core of the platform is sort of this horizontal rectangle, which is a purpose-built storage engine that's optimized for graph traversal and is durable and acid and provides immediate consistency guarantees. That's built on top of a cloud-native storage layer that we use to provide multiple availability zone, or AZ high availability. So every version of Neptune that you start has HA. And we also support encryption at rest, uh, up to 15 different read replicas. So you can use Neptune to grow with you as your knowledge graph grows. So these are just a sort of a summary of the different options. So you, you choose completely how you deploy it. We have SDK and API options for deployment. And we're continuously updating it. So last week we launched the in Asia Pacific in Seoul. We also launched uh, support for Sparkle query explanation to take a look at the query plans that are generated for your Sparkle queries. Over the past year, we've launched an SLA for a three nines SLA for the service. We also launched in Asia Pacific Mumbai uh, and also in the Tokyo region. So we're continuing to expand the service globally. And to the last point, customers are really excited about Graph but need help getting started. I think this is where this community can really help help people to understand what are the best practices. We've put a few things together ourselves, and I'll just flip through them. And if you'll notice um, on the bottom of each of the slides, there's a little bit of a tiny URL, and it's kg may 19-1-2-3. So if you are interested in following along, you certainly can. The first thing that we have is sort of reference architectures for graph databases on AWS. This is not necessarily Neptune specific. This covers what are some of the, how do you think about deploying a graph database on AWS? What are some of the basics of graph data modeling? How do I connect it? How do I secure it? So these kinds of questions. We have some blog resources. So we published a blog with a, one of our AWS partner network partners, a company in Germany called Metafax, about getting started with knowledge graphs using Neptune. We have some related blogs about using Jupyter Notebooks, if you're inter interested in that. We also have CloudFormation is a declarative way for you to provision AWS resources, so we provide support for that. And then we have GitHub code samples, as well as tools and utilities for you to use with your graph. So with that, say thank you very much. I will be uh, here for the rest of the afternoon and of course participating in the panel, so thank you. <laughs>